Hello class, this is CCNA Voice, Chapter 6, Understanding the CME Dial Plan, and I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. Let's begin looking at analog voice ports. We have two types of analog voice ports that we'll start with. The FXS and the FXO port. So this is often confusing to students. The ports look the same. They both typically use an RJ11 um, connector, the same type of connector you would have on a home telephone. One, the FXS port, indeed is designed to plug into that type of device, a phone, a fax machine, or an answering machine. The FXO port is the port like the phone plugs into in your wall at home. That would be where you would plug a telephony device. So a PBX, the PSTN, or POTS, both of those are the phone company. Again, a router will have both of these ports. So the router can behave like a phone and be plugged into a PBX, PSTN, or POTS, or the router can behave like a phone company, allowing you to plug a phone, fax, or answering machine into it. When we configure analog voice ports, we can begin with the show voice port summary command that will list our voice ports for us. They're also listed in the show run, but this will call them out specifically, giving us all the information we need. There are three configurable areas for an analog voice port. We can configure the type of signaling, the call progress, and the caller ID. Let's look at these. With signaling, we're either going to have ground start or loop start. Ground start is more commonly seen with a PBX machine in a business environment. Loop start is the type of signaling that you would see in a home or home office, the type of phone line the phone company would run to the typical house. If you have an FXO port on a router, its default signaling is set to loop start. So you wouldn't need to type this command. But as an example, that's how you would set it to loop start. Let's look at call progress. Call progress is going to be the type of tones that tell you the progress of the call. It's like a busy signal or ring, and they are country specific. In this case, you see the commands for setting the call progress tones to United States. If you did a question mark after CP tone, you could see the countries supported on your router. Let's look at caller ID. This is how I would set the caller ID on an analog voice port. I would simply give it a name and a number. Now when this port makes a call, it will provide that caller ID information to the receiving phone. FXO ports use many of the same commands as FXS ports. They're almost identical. There are two additional commands that are unique to FXO ports. They are dial type, which allows you to choose the dual tone multi-frequency, which is typical of a modern number pad on a phone, or pulse dialing, which is the older rotary dial. And then ring number. This is how many rings before it auto answers. Imagine you have a router and the FXO port is telling it how many times to let that device ring before it picks up the line. Typically something like three is the value we would hear here, three rings. Configuring digital voice ports. The typical digital voice port will be the T1. There are several types of T1s. The first type we'll look at is CAS, sometimes called robbed bit signaling. So a CAS T1 provides 24 channels, but robs bits out of each channel to provide the signaling. This is how you would set up a CAS interface. Here's a look at a T1 CCS or common channel signaling, such as an ISDN PRI, 
and this type of a T1, you get 23 voice channels, and the 24th channel is used to carry signaling information. No bits are robbed out of the voice channels. These are the most common type of T1 you will see today, and these are the commands to configure it. Now we can move on to a new topic, understanding dial peers. Whether you're going to have analog or digital ports, or you're going to have VoIP connections, VoIP devices, you are going to need a dial peer, which is essentially a static route for telephone calls. So this defines the voice reachability information, so essentially a static route. It has a match criteria and then a, a next hop, or a, a call leg is what we call this. There are two types of dial peers. One type of dial peer will point to an analog or digital line, a non-VoIP line. So that would point to a port that is not part of the VoIP network. The other type of dial peer is a VoIP dial peer, and that would be a dial peer that is pointing to an IP address. So you're either pointing to a physical port or an IP address, and you have to declare that in your dial peer. Let's take a look at call legs. Call leg is the concept of a connection to or from a voice gateway. So this is things egressing or coming onto your VoIP network. So it's the same kind of concept as hop count when we talk about routing protocols. How many call legs defines how far away the destination is across your VoIP network. When we're looking at calls, entering and exiting the VoIP network. We'll look at some examples of this. Here is a simple VoIP network. You can see we have a CME router, a Call Manager Express router on the left, and then we have a voice-enabled router on the right. In between them is a standard IP network. And then we have a POTS phone attached on either end. So one call leg will be the POTS phone coming into the VoIP network, shown with the blue arrow on the left. And then the other call legs show how it progresses. We'll look at these in detail. Call leg one, the POTS call arrives at the originating CME router. An inbound POTS dial peer is matched. The originating CME router gateway creates an inbound POTS call leg and assigns it a call ID. The second call leg is created. The originating router now uses the dialed string to match an outbound dial peer. The originating CME router will now create an outbound call leg and assign it a call ID. Time for our third call leg. The voice network call requests arrive at the terminating router gateway. An inbound voice network dial peer is matched. At this time, the terminating voice router gateway creates the inbound voice network call leg and assigns it a call ID. So we've created three call IDs, three call legs, each with a call ID. The fourth and final call leg is now created by the terminating voice router using the dialed string to match an outbound POTS dial peer. The terminating gateway creates an outbound POTS call leg. It assigns it a call ID and terminates the call. Let's look at how we would configure those dial peers. If we go into the CME router, and you'll notice I've added some ports and some IP information to help us as we type in this fictitious, fictitious configuration for the CME router. You'll see in this case we are going to follow the same four call legs to try to get extension 1001 on the left to dial extension 2001. In order to route that call, we need to create our first call leg which is accepting a call on port 030. That would be the analog voice port. So notice the call dial peer is the type POTS for analog. And we've created a destination pattern. Remember that call legs have to be able to handle the call bidirectionally. 
So this call leg is actually, this dial pier, sorry, is actually going to handle traffic as it returns back out port 030. So imagine your traffic has gone across the network and is coming back. So it would be coming back from 2001. It would be looking for 1001. So that's why the destination pattern is 1001. So that is actually for traffic headed from the right to the left of the screen. This is the dial pier that is going to be matched to move the call from the CME router into the IP network. So if I was at the phone on the left side and dialed 2001, you would see it would match the destination pattern. It would match the two implicitly and then the dot, dot, dot are wildcard placeholders for any zero through nine digit. So any of, if it had been 2222 or 2002, they would all match this pattern. I'm then sending the call to the next hop, if you will, to the next voice enabled router, and that would be 10002 across my IP network. So this is a VoIP dial pier. Now we move over to the voice router, and we can go ahead and again make our call leg or dial pier headed back to the left first. So we're working kind of two directions. We have to be thinking about how we get back as well as how we get there. Again, this is just like a static route where you have to be thinking about the round trip. So we're creating a dial pier in case 2001 needed to call 1001. So we've created that destination pattern match and pointed it back to the CME router. Now to finish our journey from 1001 to 2001, we use this dial pier. And this matches the pattern 2001 implicitly and routes it out port 030, ringing the phone. So four dial peers are required to create the end-to-end -end or round trip call routing. Let's move on to digit manipulation. Private line automatic ringdown or PLAR is commonly used on an analog voice port to map it to a internal extension. This allows any outside call to ring down into one phone. So you might have a phone at a receptionist uh, station, say it's extension 2001. So anyone calling into the business on the analog line, the router will route that call to 2001. That's a nice easy way to send all incoming calls to a specific extension. Let's take a look at destination patterns. So with digit manipulation, we can look at different ways we can match a pattern. You can see in the example here, any number dialed that starts with 555, and then the fourth digit is either a one, two, or three, that's that one through three, that with the brackets, the brackets say anything inside the brackets are a single digit and then it provides within the brackets the parameters that that single digit must match. In this case, the fourth digit has to be a one, two, or three. And then it would have to have three additional digits after that, and that's the dot, 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 and they could be zero, each be zero through nine. So this, would, for instance, if I dialed five, 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 one, two, three, four, that would match this destination pattern. If we're going to use a voice analog port, we might use no digit strip. By default, a POTS or analog voice port will strip the first digit. Typically, when you want to dial an outside line, you would dial a nine or an eight, and that would be adding an extra digit on the front that uh, should be stripped off. If you are not using a special number to reach an outside line, you would not want to strip the first digit, otherwise you wouldn't have a valid phone number. So you may have to use the command no digit strip if you do not want to strip the first digit off of a number going out an analog port. More digit manipulation. Here are three dial peers. 
which one will match the number 555-1234? Some rules to keep in mind. It looks for the longest digit match and it also looks for the first digit match. So in this case, it's going to match the second dial here. 5551 dot dot dot. However, However, as soon as you dial 5551, you'll have a match with dial peer 3. Before you have a chance to dial 234, it will have already matched dial peer 3. So dial peer 3 will actually trump dial peer 2. You see why that is? Because you haven't yet dialed the last three digits and the router will find a match. It compares the digits as you're dialing them. So as you type the digits, the router is looking for a match. So as soon as there's a match, so you have to be careful with this. Let's do some more digit manipulation. Here's two. In this case, we are using the T wildcard, which matches any number of digits 0 to 32. So if we dialed 5551, it would not match the first dial peer. So the first dial peer might be for reaching a seven digit number where the second dial peer could be used to reach a four digit extension, except we would have to hit the pound sign to complete the call and make it match the second dial peer because the T is zero through 32 digits. So it would be sitting there waiting until we hit the pound sign. So there are times when you may have to use a pound sign to complete a call, depending on how you write your dial peers. More digit manipulation. In this case, we're going to take a look at the preference number. Notice we have two identical dial peers that go to two different session targets. Preference zero would be the one that would be used for this match. So if we dialed 5551 and then any three other digits, 234, it would always match preference zero. So you can use a preference on otherwise seemingly equal dial peers to have one elevated in preference. Translation profiles. I won't have time to get into those in this lecture, but your book has a lot of information on them and you have a lab where you can create a translation profile. Essentially, they're the same as digit manipulation, but allow you to create more complicated manipulations and you can write them as a script and then link them to a dial peer. So you would reference a translation profile within your dial peer. So they're reusable, which is nice. You could use them within several different dial peers, for instance, um, and they're useful for doing complicated translations. You can go on the internet and download all kinds of pre-written translation profiles, but they're typically used to do things that are far more advanced than could be accomplished with the simple digit manipulations of wild cards and digit stripping and the things we've already talked about. Another topic is core lists. So class of restriction. These lists are just simple calling restriction lists, for instance, to prevent people from dialing 900 numbers, international numbers, or, or even getting an outside line in some cases. Let's talk about quality of service. Why do you do quality of service? You do it if you have one or more of these issues. You may have a lack of bandwidth. You may have delay. Could be fixed delay, variable delay, or jitter. Those are the three basic types of delay. A fixed delay would be the type that you have, like a processing delay that is a fixed delay that you would have within a device, or um, the propagation delay that you have across a fiber optic or copper wire is also a fixed delay. You also then have variable delays, and jitter is the worst. That is a unpredictable change in delay, where your delay is jittering up and down. 
You could have packet loss where packets are not making it across the network. Any of these three situations will require you to implement quality of service. Some things to keep in mind, lack of bandwidth, depending on the codec that you use, you might need as little as 30 kilobits per second or up to 256 kilobits per second for each voice call. Depending if you're going to do high def voice or you're going to use highly compressed voice. Delay. The book says you should keep your delay, your end-to-end -end delay should be 150 milliseconds or less. The human ear can perceive, or the human brain, if you will, can perceive delays of around 200 milliseconds. So as long as we're under 200, theoretically, the average human cannot perceive the delay. 150 is the recommended maximum delay to have end-to-end -end on a voice network. Packet loss. Again, this will vary depending on some factors, but 1% is a pretty good rule of thumb. If you are exceeding 1% packet loss, you need to look at implementing quality of service to reduce your packet loss. Let's take a look at the three different types of quality of service we can implement. It's kind of funny because the first isn't a type at all. It's just listed there in your book. But best effort is what we do without quality of service. By default, we don't have quality of service and we make a best effort to deliver things, much like just putting an envelope in the mail. It's thrown in with everyone else's mail and a best effort is made to deliver that envelope across the network. So we would want to use either integrated services or differentiated services. With integrated services, we get guaranteed bandwidth through the RSVP protocol. So for instance, if phone A was calling phone B, a certain amount of bandwidth would be requested and reserved in the routers between those two calling devices. And for the duration of their call, that bandwidth would be locked down and reserved for the call. This is the only way to get guaranteed bandwidth, but it is fairly wasteful and rigid and you could run out of bandwidth fairly easily. If you instead look at differentiated services, which is the most popular and the one we focus on in our curriculum, it uses a class system where you have more privileged classes and less privileged classes. And you would put your voice in the higher privileged class, allowing them to take cuts to the front of the line essentially. So if you have a congested interface, the higher classes get to move to the front of the line and the lower classes are um, put to the back. Some link efficiency mechanisms that are related to quality of service, these can be implemented. You could do payload compression. It takes extra CPU and adds extra delay, but it can deal with low bandwidth. You could take the payload of all the packets and compress it before it's sent across a low speed serial link and then uncompress it on the other side. You can do the same thing with a header. With the header compression, you can get a header down to about two bytes. So you can reduce the size of a large 20 byte plus header down to two bytes. You could also do link fragmentation and interleaving. This is helpful if you have large download files um, in frame relay networks, they could be up to 4,000 bytes in length. You can program the router to break those up or fragment them into smaller pieces and then interleave them with the other traffic, allowing a more even flow of the packet size. This uh, helps with things like serial delay. Queuing algorithms. So we have several different mechanisms we can use to do queuing if we determine we need to. One is called weighted fair queue. And weighted fair queue is the easiest. It just takes a packet from each queue and sends it in a round robin fashion. You can adjust the weights on these queues so that more packets are taken from one queue than another and essentially get an un equal distribution, preferencing certain queues over others. You could use a class-based weighted fair queue, 
which would be an adaptation on weighted fair queue where you have implemented also a class system as well as the queues. You could use low latency queuing, which is very popular and very fast, and it will be the focus of, of uh, technology we talk about in a moment called auto QoS. Some others, there are many other queuing strategies. I listed just one, which is also popular, called priority queuing. It's not talked about specifically in your book, but priority queuing is very useful if you have a small amount of voice traffic. If what you're prioritizing is de minimis or small, it would be the effective solution. If, however, you have a lot of voice traffic, priority queuing could cause the unpriority traffic to languish and never get across the link. So it doesn't have any real load balancing. Auto QoS is the preferred way Cisco wants you to deploy quality of service. And it's pretty cool. A single command configures it on a device. To do auto QoS, you have to understand three things. What a trust boundary is. A trust boundary is how far out the perimeter within your network that you can trust the QoS settings on packets and frames. So that would beyond the trust boundary would be devices like a PC and other endpoints that you don't trust them to set their own quality of service. And so the quality of service would be established or set at the trust boundary. For auto QoS to work, the devices must have CDP enabled. They utilize CDP to set everything up. And auto QoS will use LLQ as the queuing strategy. This is the command for a switch. You simply go into a port that a Cisco phone is attached to and type auto QoS VoIP Cisco phone and it will configure everything for you. After you do this, if you type show run, you will see dozens of additional commands added to your switch. If you ever wanted to remove auto QoS, just put a no in front of the command and it would take all those commands back out. On the router, we would go into the port facing our switch where the phones are, and we would type auto QoS VoIP trust, indicating that that is a trusted port and you could trust the QoS coming in from the switch. In summary, we've looked at analog and digital voice ports, dial peers and call legs, digit manipulation and translation profiles, COR lists and QoS.